Hello, everybody. Time to have fun once again. It's another edition of Our Town here on 94.9 and 99.1 The River. My name is Darren Swenson. Our Town, as always, brought to you by Decora Bank and Trust. Five guests on the program this morning. A couple of big school votes coming up next week. We'll talk to uh, Clark Goats. He's from the South Wind Vote Yes Committee. The uh, South Wind District uh, voting on a $19.1 million bond issue for a new high school to be built on the Northeast Iowa Community College campus. We'll talk to Clark about that later on in the show. The North Fayette Valley School District will be voting on a physical plant and equipment levy next week. We'll talk to NFV Superintendent Joe Griffith about that. Next week as well, uh, the Rocky Horror P Picture Show is uh, going to be a production from the new Minowa players. We'll chat about uh, that with Aaron Qualley. This weekend, it's the uh, Northeast Iowa Craft and Bake Sale, the 35th annual event at Decorah High School. It's put on by the Decorah Music Boosters. We'll chat with Decorah Music, vocal music instructor Jason Rouse about that. But first things first this morning, uh, Medicare Open Enrollment has started. And with us to discuss that is SHIP Counselor Jim Sims. We'll have his conversation first. This is Our Town on 94.9 and 99.1 won The River. With us now is Jim Sims. He's with the Senior Health Insurance Information Program, SHIP, and he's here to talk to us about Medicare open enrollment. Jim, thanks for taking the time with us. Yes, thanks for the call, Darren. Tell us uh, about uh, what folks need to know uh, regarding Medicare open enrollment at the present time. Well, open enrollment runs from October 15th till December 7th every year opportunity for seniors on Medicare to change their prescription drug plans, uh, review their Medicare Advantage plans, and in some cases, uh, review their Medicare supplement and make some changes. And who is eligible to uh, enroll, eligible to uh, change uh, their policy? Uh, what, who does this all affect? Uh, affects uh, seniors 65 and older uh, disabled people under 65, uh, seniors in nursing homes, uh, everybody that's on Medicare can check their medications, do a comparison online. We use Medicare.gov website to do that comparison. And if we find out there's a lower cost plan, we can enroll them in the new plan. What type of assistance is provided for uh, those that uh, may have questions or those that need help uh, exploring their options at this time? Well, it can be a little confusing for seniors, uh, especially if they aren't as computer literate as uh, they might be. Uh, there's 22 plans in Iowa this year. Uh, plans go from $6.80 per month for premium to a high of $116. Uh, deductibles also vary, going from zero, 100, and majority at $480 a year deductible. And how do you uh, make sure uh, to match up uh, the seniors uh, with the plan that is right for them? What we need is the senior name, address, of course, phone number, their Medicare number, uh, date of birth, a list of the medications and the dosages that they use. We enter this information into the website at medicare.gov and it brings up their current plan for next year and what those costs will be. And it gives us the lowest cost plan out of those 22 plans. Uh, we inform them of what this information is and if it saves them money, we can enroll them in the new plan. And if uh, folks have questions, if uh, folks have uh, are needing help uh, regarding uh, signing up for uh, for this uh, Medicare open enrollment, uh, what type of information uh, does uh, SHIP provide? Uh, by calling uh, the SHIP office at Winnishik Medical Center, and that is 563-387-3036. Carla Bakken there uh, sets up appointments for us. There's two of us this year, uh, Karen McLean and myself, that are meeting face-to-face uh, -face if the client is fully vaccinated and uh, wears 
a mask. Otherwise, we do, like we have for the last year and a half, uh, telephone interviews. And when are those uh, interviews uh, available? When is the assistance available? Uh, they can call uh, any time. Uh, I work most days from home and uh, then at the hospital when appointments are set up. Anything else uh, the public needs to know about uh, Medicare open enrollment and the uh, services that SHIP provides? Uh, definitely everybody asks about these TV ads where I can get uh, dental care and eye care and hearing aids and uh, there's no premium. Uh, that's some of the information. What they need to do is dwell deeper and get the details. We've even had reports of one plan giving the 800 number on TV. The person calls in. The first thing they ask is, can I have your Medicare number so I can find the correct plan for you? Never do that. Well, this one individual was automatically enrolled in the plan, even though they had not given the okay to do that. You tell people, secure your Medicare card like it's a credit card, don't give it out unless you know for sure who you're talking to. All right, Jim, we appreciate you taking some time to talk about Medicare open enrollment and the services that uh, SHIP provides. We appreciate uh, you taking some time and uh, thank you for all your, the work that you do to uh, help out uh, those that uh, need some help uh, in a very important issue. Very good, Darren. I appreciate the call. Jim Sims is the uh, SHIP counselor. Medicare open enrollment is open until uh, December, early December. And uh, if you need uh, some assistance, SHIP counselors are available at 387-3036. Coming up this weekend is the 35th annual Northeast Iowa Holiday Craft and Bake Sale, sponsored by the Decora Music Boosters. And with us, Jason Rouse from uh, the vocal uh, department at Decorah High School. Uh, Jason, uh, always a fun event uh, coming up this weekend, and uh, I'd imagine uh, you guys are uh, excited and uh, rearing and ready to go. Yeah, we're so glad to be able to offer this again this year, not only for our community, but for also these vendors who rely on you know, our, our Northeast Iowa community to come out and support them and to purchase some of their goods that they're selling. Um, I always love going and finding all the, the fresh baked goods and um, enjoying them for a few days after that event. Um, it's it's good fun um, to connect with all the people and see those familiar faces. You know, I think the Music Boosters has been sponsoring this. This might be, well, it would have been our 15th, but I think our 14th since we didn't have it last year. Um, so it's good to see all these familiar faces fill in our, fill in our gym, gyms and our cafeteria again. And I know uh, when it comes to Christmas uh, this year, uh, we're going to hear a lot about uh, shipping concerns. Will you get your stuff by Christmas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Come to the high school this weekend. Uh, you can alleviate all those concerns, uh, especially for guys like me who like to procrastinate. I have been known to procrastinate also and purchase some things for my parents for Christmas. You know, what what do you get for your for your, the 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 family member who seems to have everything? Well, you get something original. Um, you know, um, especially painted uh, screens with snowmen on them is what I got from my parents a few years ago, and it gets hung up every year in the house on the old on the farm back in Cascade. So. Um, yeah, I love I, I love that idea of, of coming in and supporting these vendors, especially in this time when, you know, we're having a hard time getting goods to come in, um, to come in through all the various ways we get our Christmas presents. So come buy something original and support some area local vendors. I think it's a great idea. How many uh, vendors are going to be here this weekend and what are the hours of the show? Yeah, I think... Um, we're up to 70 right now. So we, nice. we've gained a few since we put out our press release about that. So um, it's, it's going it's uh, going well. We're glad to see some some people coming back, some new people. Um, Denise Golrud in the high school office is handling all that. She knows all the folks that are coming in. I don't know sp specifics of who, who the new folks are, but um, um, we're always excited to welcome new people into our into our building here. And uh, what are the hours uh, for the show uh, this weekend, Jason? Yeah, Saturday, um, October 30th, 9 to 4. And then on Halloween, um, we're at 10 to 3 o'clock. So you'll have time to still get home and welcome those trick-or-treaters um, to your doors. 
And from what I understand, you got some uh, raffles uh, up your sleeve this weekend as well. Yeah, when you come in, you can sign up for a free door prize, but you also can um, buy a chance um, to win a 55 inch um, 4K Ultra HD TV. Um, I think the, the chances are just $2 each or three for five, I believe. And we're grateful for all of our volunteers that are coming in, parents from the community and our students who are gonna be there to help out the vendors set up and tear down and run our concession stands. Um, we'll have um, various things at the concession stand available. So you can, get a, you can get a meal too while you're there and some bars and whatnot that we have families donating. So uh, that's one of those TVs that you and I didn't have when uh, we were kids, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, no. I mean, how cool, how cool. Um, I also, um, I wanted to mention, um, I just lost my train of thought. What was I gonna, um, um, oh, that what this all goes towards. Yes. This this is all going towards our, um, our music boosters and our music activity account that covers um, all the fees that go for students. Like we just had, um, was it, Th uh, 13, 14, no, 15 students that were selected this weekend for the All-State Music Festival um, through auditions. Um, we'll be going down to Ames in a couple of weeks. We have Opus Singers that are going down to Ames and IJOF, which is the Junior Honors Orchestra. But there's registration fees for those. There's hotel fees for this. And all of this craft show covers all of these fees, marching band fees, solo ensemble music fees. So it goes right back to the students. So the students aren't having to, to pay for hotels for uh, two or three nights in Ames in a couple of weeks. So um, we're just really grateful that we have this opportunity to, to raise this money and not ask the kids to pay um, out of their own pockets for this, for those special events where they're, they're making these wonderful honor choirs and, and state festivals and all that kind of thing. And that was going to be my next question. So uh, thanks for uh, jumping in and uh, taking my train of thought there, but uh, all, uh, Really, uh, that's what it gets down to. Uh, the music department at Decorah High School, uh, very, uh, very uh, successful uh, year in and year out. Uh, the young people, very talented in uh, year in and year out. And this is a great way to uh, not only take care of your holiday shopping, uh, get your uh, sweet tooth taken care of this weekend, but uh, you can support some uh, great young people and some very talented young people. And that's what this is all about. Yeah, and you'll get to even see some of them work in and get to see these wonderful high school students that we have here in our music department. Anything we're missing, uh, Jason? Anything else you want to pass on to us? Um, I just want to say thanks to um, Jen Anderson and Stacy Irwin, who are our leads from the Music Boosters that are handling a lot of this this work. And of course, Denise Goldrude in the office and Adam Riley for all of their immense support. So, All right, to, all right Jason, we appreciate you uh, taking a few moments to uh, tell us about the uh, craft uh, show coming up this weekend. It uh, should be a, another great event. Great to have it back uh, this year. Come on down, uh, take your holiday shopping so you're not uh, nervous on December 23rd. Uh, best of luck <laughs> with the event this weekend, Jason. Thank you, Darren. 35th annual Northeast Iowa holiday craft and bake sale sponsored by the Decorah Music Boosters, 9 to 4 Saturday, 10 to 3 Sunday at Decorah High School. Coming up next week, the new Minowa players are back in action as the Rocky Horror Show will be presented. And with us to discuss that, Aaron Qualley. And Aaron, I know uh, indoors, uh, the new Minowa players got the uh, children's show uh, back and up and running at your theater uh, last week. Uh, has to feel good to uh, get back uh, going with a live, in-person, uh, indoor uh, production, I'd imagine. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's been a long hiatus for a lot of us. It's been a long hiatus for me for directing. And this is a really exciting way for us to uh, welcome patrons back into what we do um, in a niche that might not have been the same as the children's show. So, And I know uh, you did some virtual stuff uh, over the past uh, year and a half, but uh, as a performer, as a director, uh, as someone uh, dedicated to uh, their craft uh, like yourself and everybody else involved in New Minowa Players, uh, what was it like performing with the lack of an audience? Because I'd imagine it uh, was just a weird thing. Yeah, that's the thing. Like the, the art of going through it, the own process, the process that you go through as an actor, as a director online aren't, I mean, they are, they are substantially different, but they don't feel weird. But performing without the live feedback of an audience is bizarre because jokes don't land the way that they do. Um, oftentimes when you go into a performance, you know, you've been rehearsing things for a while while things get stale um 
and like, you know, everybody knows the jokes already. You're not like laughing inside anymore, but then there's a new energy that comes when people are seeing what you've done for the first time. Um, and doing that online, there just isn't that feedback. It makes it really hard to like gauge where things are landing. Um, so it has been very nice to be back in person with a cast. Um, and we were very, very excited to share the work that we've done with a live audience. How long have you guys uh, been at uh, rehearsing? Uh, how long have you uh, guys uh, been at uh, work uh, getting ready for the production that starts next week? So I, as a director, have been planning since May. Um, so it's been a pretty long process for me. We started rehearsals in September. Um, so it's roughly a two-month rehearsal process that we've had. Um, yeah. How many people are involved in this production? Oh man, um, our cast has fluctuated in size a little bit as things go, um, but we're looking at probably somewhere around 16 cast members. And uh, as far as the production team goes, like eight of us, okay. so 25-ish people. Yeah, I promised there wasn't going to be any mass, so I apologize for that last question <laughs> there, Aaron. Well, but, it's uh, hard to keep track of because we've had people come and go, and yeah, but no doubt about it. Uh, tell us about the uh, Rocky Horror Show for those that uh, don't know. Uh, give us uh, what the uh, production is going to be all about. So, if you've seen the 1975 film, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, um, the Rocky Horror Show is the stage musical that that film is based on. Um, and even if you are a diehard fan of the movie, there are definitely some pretty substantial differences in the stage show. There are two songs that didn't make the cut into the U.S. release of the film. Um, there are sequences, things happen in a little bit of a different order um, and in a different way. Some characters have lines that didn't have lines in the original film. So it's kind of like a, it's a cool additional thing. If you're not familiar with the film or the stage play, I mean, you were in for a wild ride. So it is. Um, it was written by Richard O'Brien as an homage to the um, B horror movies that he loved growing up in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, especially. Um, and the structure of the play is kind of set up in the same way where the, it's a double feature. You've got an A plot and a B plot. So the A part of the play um, features this young, very average couple, Brad and Janet, um, uh, they've just gotten engaged. They're out um, driving to meet with a friend and they blow out a tire. Um, the only like place they can go to help, for, go for help um, in the vicinity is this old castle that for some reason exists um, in rural America. And uh, they go there and find themselves in the middle of um, kind of a mad scientist horror film plot. Um, with some very strange, socially non-conforming undertones. And then the B part of the uh, play uh, takes another sci-fi uh, tilt into a different direction that I won't spoil. Okay. Um, but it's kind of an, an, an A-B plot where you do get kind of a double feature story. And so the result of it is for both the film and the play that the first time that a person sees it, it's kind of more of a spectacle and less of a story because it can be kind of hard to track how things like run together and the whole thing is just so weird, but that's what people have loved about it. Um, the music is really great and it uh, definitely is worth multiple viewings because you can kind of start to connect dots once you understand the whole double feature structure. And when you are putting on a production like this, uh, a production that a lot of people know, some may not, but a lot of people are familiar with the play and many uh, more are probably even familiar with the movie. How do you take a production like this and make it yours? Um, it's been a challenge. Uh, part of what my goal was coming into this is that I wanted to take the spirit of the film because that's what most people know. It's what they're going to expect. Capture what the parts that make the film great and bring the parts of that that we can to the stage. Now, obviously not everything translates well from screen to stage, um, but to, to try to keep those things there without doing them exactly the same way. So we've had a lot of conversations as a cast about the underlying plot of this thing, um, about the motivations that different characters have, and some of our actors have come to different conclusions than I think some of the film actors did, um, which will lead to some different dynamics on stage in ways that I find very exciting and fun. And so it should be fresh even for fans of the movie. Um, we're also doing it in a space that is not necessarily intended for theater. Um, we're doing it at Impact Coffee. Um, and it has actually turned out to be a pretty great uh, performance space. 
and I think that that challenge alone brings a certain degree of freshness to it because we are adapting something for a space that kind of has its own character. Mm. Um, and so there's a lot more burden placed on the acting and um, the other elements of performance that like a set can't convey for us because mm -hmm. we aren't bringing a set into the space really. Um, we have limited props and costuming uh, compared to like what a, a movie could do. And so I think that there is a more human element to this than what the movie has because the emphasis is more on performance and less on the overall spectacle of the thing. And that's part of the fun of what you do, I'd imagine too, right? Absolutely. Yep. Tell us uh, when uh, folks can go out and uh, see this. Uh, performances will be the 5th, 6th, and 7th of November. That's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. All of them are at 7.30 p.m. at Impact. Yep. And uh, how can folks uh, get tickets? Currently, the only way to get tickets is to buy them online at newminowaplayers.org. That's new Minowa, M-I-N-O-W-A, players.org. Um, we in the past have had them at the co-op, but the Friday and Saturday shows have been selling very, very fast to the point where we need to kind of reclaim our under, you know, <laughs> that stock so that we can make sure that everybody gets a ticket. Um, so Sunday right now, you can still get tickets for that online pretty avail pretty readily. And the event that we sell out um, any performance, my advice would be for audience members to still come to the door and ask about getting in if that's the time that works for you. Um, we have an idea of how many people we can fit into that impact space. Uh, but we could probably fit more than we believe we can right now. We're just guaranteeing a certain number. Um, alternatively, uh, you can go to the co-op and ask for contact information um, for our ticketing manager. Um, give her a call and your name will be put on a wait list. Um, and then we'll take those. If we have space, those will be the people that we prioritize seating at the door um, that way. we've We are working to adapt to this very unexpected rate of selling. <laughs> uh, people are clearly excited to see the show and that's a great problem to have. Well, and I'd imagine that's a pretty cool feeling uh, from your perspective and from the cast and the production crew's perspective. You haven't done anything like this indoors in a year and a half, but the demand is still there from the public. That has to be a pretty cool feeling for you guys. Yeah, yep. It's, it's extremely exciting. Um, it's always nice, like, you know, we do what we do for the, for the sake of the art, you know, but it's always nice to have the validation of all the way people actually want to see this and to know that going into it, you know, it's good. It's given us a, a shot of energy, uh, this week going in that, like, we already know that we are almost definitely going to be performing out for two sold out audiences. Um, and the energy in that room is probably going to be pretty incredible because we will encourage audience participation, um, in the vein of some of the late night showings of the movie. So. All right. Uh, anything we're missing, Aaron? Anything else you want to pass on? Um, I would say that if you are thinking about coming with kids, that while we are not going to be barring people of any age from coming, that the nature of the show is absolutely PG-13 and that it may tilt towards R depending on what kind of an energy an audience brings into that room. So probably not a show that is totally appropriate for kids younger than 14 or 15. Um and so, you know, but if you think you have a younger kid that could deal with the content, then uh, we just encourage parental discretion. All right, uh, Aaron, we appreciate you taking some time uh, telling us about the uh, Rocky Horror Show coming up uh, next week. Uh, we wish best of luck. Uh, congrats on getting to uh, do your uh, thing once again uh, in front of an audience uh, indoors. That uh, has to be a great feeling for you guys. And uh, best of luck uh, next week uh, with the uh, productions. And uh, hopefully they all sell out. And uh, Maybe uh, there'll be standing room only uh, for all three performances. That'd be a pretty awesome thing. Could be. Thanks for your time. Aaron Qualley uh, with the new Minowa Players. Rocky Horror Show coming up next week at Impact Coffee. Go to newminowaplayers.org for uh, all of the information. The North Fayette Valley School District will go to the polls to decide on a Pepple levy next Tuesday, and here to discuss that is Joe Griffith, the superintendent of the North Fayette Valley School District. And Joe, let's start uh, with the basics. What is the physical plant and equipment levy? What does it fund? Why is it important to a school district? So the the physical plant and equipment levy is also called, and the 
Pebble will be used for um, building maintenance, building updates, um, things of that sort. We can use it for um, acquisition of new uh, new buildings. Um, our personal, what we're looking at for NFV is, is maintaining some of our existing buildings. We have um, heating systems that are in need of repair. We have uh, uh, efficiencies we think we can get that, that would help us by uh, replacing single pane windows and some of the uh, doors that aren't sealing correctly. So um, we just need a little extra money to help us to maintain what we have. We're not looking to uh, add anything beyond uh, maintaining what we have. And when it comes to the Pepel levy, uh, how much would that cost an average uh, taxpayer in your school district? So you'd have to figure out what that would look like for your own home and your property. Um, what we are asking for is $1 per thousand. So that would be um, 33 cents less than the state uh, allows us to. So we, we think we can get done what we need to for that $1 per thousand. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly things will have to be done in phases as a result of that, but trying to be a, a responsible um, person that's involved in these types of things and being respectful of the taxpayer, we think that, that that's that's the right number to ask for. And when it comes to the Pepple levy, I know it's kind of a, a unique situation with the Valley and North Fayette school districts combining in the not too distant past, but what is the Pepple levy right now and how does it compare to what you will be asking next week? So the voter enacted PEPL has been, um, was dropped in 2018. So we currently do not have that. Um, one of the things that I think people should, should remember is that prior to that, both North Faya and Valley School Districts supported that. And they ran tax rates that were, oh, in the, the 13 to 14 range at times. Um, we have been fortunate to have state subsidies on our, our property tax rates through the last few years because of the uh, sharing incentive. Um, so we've been in the 11s, give or take, a little higher um, 11s most of the time. Uh, this year, due to some unexpected expenditures, we were right at that, that 12 um, rate. And we think that even with adding the uh, $1 per thousand, we can stay right at that 12 rate for, for, a, for a good period of time, we hope. And you mentioned uh, that the uh, Pepple levy or the state allows you to go to $1.34 on that Pepple levy, but how'd you come up with the $1 rate uh, as you uh, started to propose this? Um, we kind of started looking at the things that we needed, needed to do and what our current rate was. And I wasn't comfortable asking more than... Um, that that dollar, and we knew that if we if we were able to phase projects in, we could get our our rate where we wanted to to be, and we could get our projects done over over a span of time. And I know when it comes to the Pepple levy and uh, the things you're talking about, uh, a lot of these uh, issues get talked about uh, the same with the save dollars or the one cent uh, local option sales tax dollars. But I know it's not local anymore because the whole state has it. But what does state code allow the PEPL dollars to be put towards? What does state code allow the one cent dollars to be put towards? Uh, what is the difference between the two? Okay, so they, they can be used for very similar things. Um, the, the differences are, are far fewer than the similarities. So um, one of the things I'd like to maybe point out is what we are currently using our saved dollars for. So our saved dollars right now, we've borrowed against them for several larger projects like our North Gym. Um, we borrowed against some of our future saved money for the West Union Elementary um, HVAC project that we're working on right now. Um, that building was a 1957 uh, steam system that, that was definitely on its last legs. Um, we have got uh, some buses come out of our, our save money, those types of things. So right now we have the 33 cent board enacted pebble. So some of the things that are coming out of the board enacted pebble would be uh, some technology, parking lot maintenance, um, paid for uh, some seating last year on a baseball field. Uh, portions of our playground last year came out of that save money. Um, hot water heater, things of that sort. So they're very similar in use, and and we are uh, we we have been very conscientious to make sure that we maximize those. 
and related to the vote itself, I know uh, with bond issues uh, in school districts, you need 60%. Is this a simple majority vote? So this is a simple majority vote. It's a 50% plus one. Um, once it's enacted, it will be in place for 10 years, um, at which point then it would need to be put out for the voters to make uh, uh, another decision on it. And, and um, you know, at that point, then they would have the opportunity to uh, support it or turn it down once, once some of these projects are taken care of. And in the big picture, why is it important uh, for this uh, pebble to go through to make sure the district uh, is able to provide the services uh, you're assigned to provide the community? You bet. So our buildings are, are structurally sound, but some of the mechanicals inside of them are, are definitely starting to show their age. Um, we have a 1970 uh, older section of our high school that is kind of, we, we're, we're always a little concerned about some of those unit ventilators. Um, Fayette, this morning we had a, a unit that went down and leaked water in a fair number of places because of the heating. Um, we've got just a variety of different efficiencies that we'd like to look at, whether it be windows that, that are single pane and doors that don't seal quite right, that it's just going to take more money than we have to start addressing these, these uh, ongoing um, updates that need to happen in order to uh, keep our district efficient and to keep our buildings um, usable and, and comfortable for our kids in our community. And I'd imagine there's probably things on that list that might come up that you're not thinking about right now too, correct? I had not anticipated this uh, this heater at Fayette today. All right, uh, Joe. Oh, uh, anything else that you want to uh, pass on to the community regarding uh, next Tuesday's vote? Well, I just want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to vote. Um, that is next Tuesday. The, the auditor's office, I uh, visited with them the other day. Voting is from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. You can find uh, voting locations um, both on the auditor's website or in the uh, local newspaper if you're looking for them. Joe, you know, we appreciate the time and the information uh, passed on to us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darren. Joe Griffith is the superintendent of the North Fayette School District, a pebble vote going before voters next Tuesday. Coming up next Tuesday, a very important day in the uh, well, everywhere with the uh, general election taking place, but very important in the South Wintersheek School District as a uh, bond issue vote will go before voters. And uh, Clark Goltz is part of the uh, South Wind Vote Yes Committee, and he joins us this morning to discuss the upcoming vote. Clark, always a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, it's good to see you, Darren. Gosh, we don't do this Zooming enough, so keep this going. I like this. I'll do the best I can with uh, what I got. Uh, that's the only promise I will okay. uh, make on that end of things. But let's talk about the specifics of the vote coming up uh, next uh, week. What exactly will voters be asked to do as part of this uh, bond issue vote? Well, what they're doing, Darren, is they're voting on a special election for the sale of up to $19 million in general obligation bonds for a new high school. And that's going to come across on their ballot as Proposition S and Proposition W. So they have to vote yes for both of those in order for this to pass. So it's a new high school on the Northeast Iowa Community College property. And what specifically will the two questions be? The uh, two questions will be asking them, first of all, can they be uh, having this election for a new um, high school? And secondly, can they have a tax increase to pay for those? Those are the two questions that they'll be asking. And related to some of the information that's uh, being discussed in the community related to this vote, uh, some may mm -hmm. say that uh, South Winnipeg is dealing with an enrollment decline. Why is this the right time to build a new high school when there is declining enrollment? What say you? Well, actually, the decrement uh, the enrollment has been very steady over a period of time, and we see it staying that way. We see a, a school of around 700 for the foreseeable future. So I guess I would disagree when people say that it's declining. Certainly there are ups and downs in enrollment, and that's very typical in Iowa. And generally in Iowa, there has been a decline in enrollment. We see ours being pretty steady. So the point is that you want to build for the future. And that's what we're going to be doing with this new high school. 
And as we look into the future, technology is definitely going to be more and more of a part of education. Why can't uh, the technology that uh, is being proposed uh, as we look into the future, why can't you just install that at the current building? Well, some of the reason why is, Darren, if they've gone into the building, there are some great people, David and Connie and Kyle, who maintain that building. But it's going to be what some, most of it was built in 1930. There's only so much you can do within an infrastructure. So it's not only about technology. It's about 11 more careers that will be available at Northeast Iowa Community College in, cooper in cooperation with your career academy. So it's not just technology. It's about apprenticeships and mentorships and job opportunities that are coming along with that. And related to locating this high school on the Northeast Iowa Community mm -hmm. College campus, uh, doesn't the district have a partnership with NICC now? And frankly, you're not that far away from NICC where the high school is located right now. How does this, uh, what's the benefit of building on the NICC campus? Well, first of all, there is great faith with the board of trustees from Northeast Iowa Community College. They have voted to say if when the bond issue passes for the sale of one dollar, we'll be giving you 11 acres of land to put this high school on. That's pretty impressive that they want to do that. Secondly, it's not just about proximity. Sure, it's within a few blocks, but there's a 20, 10 minute drive over, a 10 minute drive back. You lose time in the classroom. So if we have a high school that's right on that campus, not only will it be the proximity, which is just literally walking to the next building, but it'll expand the programs that are available there. And related to uh, any tax levy increase related to the building of this new building or mm -hmm. this potential new building as it stands right now, how would the average Southwind property tax owner uh, be affected uh, if uh, they vote, uh, if there is a positive vote next Tuesday? When that positive vote comes through, Darren, if you have an assessed value of a house for $100,000, then they go back to the taxable value of that house. So your monthly increases for your taxes would be $10.68 a month for that $100,000 house. Let's say that you have a business of uh, worth valued at taxable value of 100,000, then that increase would be $18.65 a month. So we're talking for the benefits that you're going to see for the young people that are, well, first of all, could be grandkids, like I have six of them who are in the district, or your neighbor's grandkids or the kids who go to your church or who live down your street. This is the kind of investment you want to make for them. So that's the, that'll be the impact of what those taxes will be. What will exactly be included in this new high school that the current high school does not have right now? Well, the first thing that'll be included is about 9,000 square feet of less hallway. So that's kind of a big thing. Instead of putting it into hallways and levels and buildings, you're going to put it into classrooms that are going to be just really functional. It's going to be those kinds of classrooms that are ready for the 21st century learning. And when they say that, we think, what does that mean? It means, you know, where air indication and areas where you can work and you can do experiments and you can do demonstrations and you can have technology and you can make really learning come alive in a setting that's like that. Those are the kinds of things that are going to be in place. And, and also, there's also going to be, uh, as you would guess, some opportunities for um, athletics and fine arts in those buildings. And again, there'll be the traditional classrooms for mathematics and language arts and social studies too. And what type of uh, new facilities would be included uh, related to co-curricular activities in this proposed new building? One, one of the main things, of course, is, is a new gymnasium that'll be kind of a focal point for that, a multi-purpose area, there'll be a stage area, there'll be fine arts areas. So all those will be incorporated into the, the plans of this new building. One thing we'd like to share, though, is that those are really preliminary. We start with kind of an idea of what we want to do, and we'll be meeting with the community, all groups in the community, to really refine the details of all those plans as the uh, bond issue is passed. And maybe this is a unfair question to ask, but if a positive vote happens next Tuesday, when's the earliest we could see shovels in the ground? When is the absolute earliest uh, we could see this building come to fruition? 
as I understand it, the current freshman class at South Luna, they could graduate from that new building. So it's within three years. And that's a, a pretty that's a pretty uh, aggressive uh, timetable when it comes it to is. a building like that. How uh, how are you going to make that possible? All things are possible, Darren. You just got to be positive. We're one of those groups that can get this done. We know what's going to happen. We've got we know that we're going to have the contractors and the community people to help support us. And so, when we say we're going to get this done, we're going to get this done. It's going to be exciting. And of course, when you talk buildings in the twenty first century, school security is a key factor in building and proposing uh, these uh, new facilities. How uh, would this uh, building uh, be more better on the security end of things than your current facility? Well, first of all, it's the number of entrances and exits. There are multiple exits and entrances in the current high school building. As you know, when you have three different times that a building's been added onto, then there are issues with that, even though we currently have cameras and locked doors and security on main entrance where everybody comes in a certain way. And those will be the way. And of course, the technology with cameras, both interior and exterior and lighting and all the things that you do when you, when you make sure that kids are safe. We give kids a quality education, but we also make sure the most and the highest priority is that they're safe at school. What would happen to the current high school uh, if there is a positive vote next Tuesday? When that positive vote comes next Tuesday, Darren, we're, we've had other people already interested in that high school building. Now, as you would guess, we're going to maintain the current gymnasiums and the auditorium and some of the new structures that are currently there. And then we'll look at other opportunities for the rest of the building and see if there are businesses or entrepreneurs that want to utilize that for different purposes. That would be great. We want to work on that as hard as we are on building that new building. Yeah. Why is this the right time to explore this opportunity? Probably the main reason why this is the right time is this will be allow the district to take advantage of the lowest bond interest rates for Iowa school 20 year general obligation bonds in history. And we're talking going back to the early part of this century. This is going to be the lowest bond, 20-year bond obligation rates that they're going to see. And secondly, I think because it's going to be not only, as I said, the first high school on a community college in Iowa, we understand, according to the NICC personnel, the first one in the entire United States. This is a groundbreaking, literally and figuratively, high school. So it's, it's, it's the right time now. And I guess I'll uh, throw you uh, out to uh, send you out with this uh, question. Anything you're we're missing, anything else you uh, want to pass on regarding next Tuesday's bond vote in the uh, South Winter Sheik School District? I guess the only thing I would remind people is that think about the young people who they see every single day and think about the impact that a new high school, a new high school that will offer 11 kinds of opportunities for young people in, in, the, in the jobs in the future that they will have. So this is the time to vote yes for, for your kids, for your community, and for our future. So I guess that's what I'd say. Vote yes on Proposition S and Proposition W. Clark, we appreciate you taking some time informing the folks of uh, what's going on uh, next uh, Tuesday. Uh, always a pleasure catching up with you. Same here. Thank you for your time, Darren. Have a great morning. Clark Goltz uh, is part of the uh, Vote Yes uh, South Winnesheek Committee. Uh, the bond issue vote in the South Winnesheek School District taking place next Tuesday for a new high school to be built on the NICC Kilmer campus. Our thanks to our guest on the program this morning, Clark Goltz from the South Winnesheek Vote Yes Committee, a $19.1 million bond issue going before Southwind voters next week uh, for a new high school to be built on the Northeast Iowa Community College campus. Pepple vote going before North Fayette Valley School uh, District voters next week. Joe Griffith uh, from the uh, North Fayette Valley School District, the superintendent, uh, discussing that. New minimal players back in action with the Rocky Horror Picture Show next week. Aaron Qualley, uh, we thank him for joining us. Don't forget uh, the 35th annual Northeast Iowa largest holiday 
craft and bake sale taking place this weekend at Decorah High School, put on by the Decorah Music Boosters. Thank Jason Roush for his time. And Medicare open enrollment is underway, and Jim Sims told us all about it, and we appreciate uh, him taking the time as well. Don't forget, uh, each and every week, uh, you can watch Our Town. Uh, We put uh, this show on our YouTube channel so you can actually see the interesting people we get to talk to on a week-in and week-out basis. Uh, Head to uh, any of our social media pages, uh, any of the Winnis Communication Facebook pages, and we put up the link usually uh, Wednesday night, sometimes Thursday morning uh, of the radio show that you can watch uh, via YouTube on Our Town right here on 94.9 and 99.1 one The River. Our thanks to our sponsor, Decorah Main Can Trust. Our thanks to our guest, and most importantly, we thank you for tuning in, for logging on, or for watching Our Town on 94.9 and 99.1 one The River.